schizophrenia, and I'm, I'm speeding up a little bit now because I can see that I'm running out of time, uh, is uh, enormously interesting because here we're talking really uh, changes in the way that people experience the world, how they think, uh, and how they interact uh, socially with the rest of us. It's relatively common. Um, it's between 0.2% and 2% of uh, the general population. Uh, and this is in all cultures. Uh, so it's not like it's an invention in uh, Western Europe. Uh, if you uh, go through all so sorts of society, uh, also Indians in Southern America, you find people who are very clearly uh, schizophrenic. Uh, and to some extent, uh, these tend to become medicine men or shamans or whatever, uh, because they have some experiences which other people don't have. Uh, but they are clearly what we in our culture would call schizophrenic. Uh, so schizophrenia, what characterizes it is uh, delusions and or hallucinations. So, uh, you believe things which the rest of us wouldn't agree with and which we would say that's not the way that the world works or that's not the way that you work. Uh, disorganized speech, uh, very often fabulating, having strange ideas, uh, mass men uh, coming and uh, whatever. Uh, catatonic behavior is also uh, one characteristic in some of these patients. Catatonic behavior is basically that you have some kind of a stupor. You sit without moving for a very long time. Some of them can even go completely stiff uh, and completely rigid, so that you can't hardly move any limp uh, for several hours in a row. Um, Lack of motivation, just sitting in a chair, looking out of the window day after day for weeks, for months, without moving, without doing anything. Social withdrawal, uh, deciding not to want to have anything to do with the rest of the world. Various thought disorders, reduced expression of emotion in general, and in general also difficulty in initiating goal-directed uh, movements. Uh, this is just to uh, give you some idea of the uh, different uh, experiences that uh, people with schizophrenia can report. Uh, it's in the slides that I've put on the internet, so you can uh, have a look at it there. I won't go through it uh, just here. So what is the cause of uh, schizophrenia? Again, uh, there is uh, some kind of genetic background for it. It's more of a genetic background than what is seen in depression, so it's very clearly uh, something to do with the genes, uh, but again we don't really know uh, exactly uh, what it is. So if there is a so-called genetic load, you have a high risk of uh, uh, developing uh, uh, schizophrenia, but there is usually some kind of uh, factor which contributes to this uh, genetic background. Uh, so some kind of experience that you have relatively early on, which then develops into uh, schizophrenia. But very often these are difficult to define. Uh, in other cases where you have less of a genetic, genetic uh, burden or load, uh, there are definitely events which uh, can happen in combination and which will sort of uh, induce a disbalance and uh, then lead to uh, some kind of uh, uh, atypical uh, schizophrenic psychosis. Uh, so these are what we will normally call borderline and not really uh, schizophrenic. These are uh, what we will normally uh, call schizophrenia. The Onset is usually either around puberty or somewhat after puberty, most of the time before the age of 30. So it's young people who uh, have the first, show the first symptoms of uh, schizophrenia. Uh, as things are now, this is a lifetime disorder. You're not being cured for schizophrenia, uh, but 
many of the drugs which are available can help you cope with the symptoms. Um, this is a sketch of uh, the various uh, events uh, which can contribute uh, to uh, uh, schizophrenia. So it's seen as sort of a, a lifetime uh, development which may start already early on during early de development of the brain and the fetus that because of some of these uh, genetic changes uh, especially some of the differentiation uh, and uh, development of some of the neurons uh, doesn't take place so that some of the connectivity in the brain isn't developed uh, the way that it should. But this also happens in uh, relation to environmental stimuli and if those environmental stimuli are not there then this uh, disorder will progress and then create uh, the uh, schizophrenic symptoms uh, later on in life. Um, again, just in relation to uh, uh, the genetic background, so the risk in the general population is about 1%. If you have a cousin who has the disorder, it's sort of doubled, uncles, aunts, etc. Second degree relatives, it's of about 5-6%. <coughs> Parents, siblings, children, etc., about 10%, and identical twins, it's about 50%. So it's quite high. Uh, it's really uh, hugely determined by uh, the gen genetic makeup. Uh, this is again from uh, two twins, just to show the difference uh, in the brain. What you should notice is if you just look at the ventricles here, they are much, much bigger here in the schizophrenic twin. So it is one of the signs. You can actually see it structurally. There are uh, signs of uh, not degeneration, but lacking of development of connectivity uh, in the brain of uh, schizophrenic uh, people. So you generally see what you would call atrophy of parts of the brain, as you can see out here, if you make the comparison. And if you see the ventricles, they're much, much larger, simply because there's less development of uh, brain tissue in those areas. Uh, so the, the prevailing uh, hypothesis uh, in relation to uh, what is wrong in schizophrenia uh, lies very much on uh, uh, the so-called dopamine hypothesis. Uh, and it was some years ago sort of a simplified version of uh, psychiatry that depression had to do with serotonin and schizophrenia had to do with dopamine. Uh, both have now been abandoned but uh, dopamine still plays some kind of role ex except we don't really know precisely what but what we do know is that if you take an overdose of amphetamine which really raises the level of dopamine but also of other <coughs> transmitters in the brain you develop symptoms which are similar to what you see in uh, uh, schizophrenics. Uh, so you develop hallucinations, delusions, uh, thought disorders. We know that one of the most efficient drugs for treatment of schizophrenia is chlorpromazine, which is a blocker of the dopamine D2 receptor. Uh, and actually, if we plot uh, the potency of different drugs for uh, uh, blocking the dopamine D2 receptor and look at uh, the efficiency in treating uh, schizophrenia, there is a very nice uh, linear correlation. So the more, the higher the affinity uh, for uh, treatment of, uh, uh, for, for the D2 receptor, the better the treatment of uh, schizophrenia. We also know from uh, Parkinson patients who have low levels of dopamine uh, that if you treat them with levodopa and they get an overdose of levodopa, then they develop uh, symptoms of schizophrenia, uh, hallucinations, and uh, many of the other symptoms that are also seen. Uh, so somehow dopamine has something to do with it. Uh, glutamate uh, has also been uh, implied in, in schizophrenia. Uh, 
mainly because uh, there are different um, uh, types of evidence suggesting that glutamatergic uh, neurotransmission is involved. So for instance, PCP, which is angel dust, uh, also creates uh, hallucinations. And what that does is to block uh, some of the glutamate uh, receptors very efficiently and thereby apparently uh, uh, creating uh, these hallucinations. Uh, it's known that um, mice with mutation of uh, NMDA receptors, uh, so that the NMDA receptors, glutamatergic receptors, don't work appropriately, develop uh, social problems interacting with other mice. Uh, the interpretation from uh, the people working with these mice is that the other mice simply don't want to have anything to do with them because they don't understand their behavior, they're strange mice. Whether they are now schizophrenic or not is, I think, an open question, but it is called an animal model for schizophrenia. Um, but I think it's up in the air. Again, it's not really clear why uh, and how uh, uh, glutamatergic neurotransmission should uh, influence um, uh, or, or have an effect on, on schizophrenia. Uh, so the whole uh, dopaminergic innovation is, is hugely complex. Uh, so there, there are all, all the nuclei lying in the brainstem basically and sending output to a lot of different uh, areas of, of uh, uh, the cerebrum. Uh, there are definitely some connections going to uh, the uh, areas which are involved in emotions, the area uh, projections to the prefrontal cortex and also the hippocampus, uh, which probably somewhere in this network uh, things are going uh, awfully wrong. Uh, what is seen in schizophrenic patients is that especially the network uh, connecting to the cingulate and the prefrontal cortex is downregulated in the schizophrenic patients. So the influence of dopamine onto the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system is uh, decreased. Whereas there seems to be an overactivity of uh, the uh, connections to the basal ganglia. Uh, so there seems to be a switch between these two.